Welcome back, y'all, to part two of our discussion on the Book of Common Prayer. In the first video, I introduced you to the BCP by walking you through the table of contents. And now let's talk more about how this book helps to form our identity as followers of Jesus. Let's start with the calendar of the church year in the beginning. In the beginning, God created order out of chaos setting the planets and stars in their courses to enable day and night and the seasons of the year, a rhythm for our life. The calendar of the church year weaves this rhythm into our regular remembering of God's story as we have it told to us through our holy scriptures. Through the daily and weekly and seasonal rhythm orchestrated by the BCP, we find our place in this grand story that is so much bigger than ourselves. The church calendar tells us many things. Which church season we're in, when the feast days are, who we are commemorating, and used in conjunction with the lectionary, what scriptures are to be read on any given day, and which prayers are best used. And even though the commemoration calendar that begins on page 19 of the BCP begins in January, the cycle of the church year actually starts with Advent, which begins four Sundays before Christmas Day. Advent means arrival, and in the season of Advent we anticipate the celebration of the birth of Jesus, we recognize the daily presence of Jesus with us, and we look forward to the full realization of the new heaven and new earth in God's kingdom. In the church calendar, the season of Christmas doesn't begin until December 25th and goes through January 5th. These are the real 12 days of Christmas, despite what all those sales try to teach us each year. January 6th is known as Epiphany, and it is the day that we celebrate the arrival of the wise men at the home of Mary and Joseph to honor the baby Jesus. So don't put them out in your nativity scene until January 6th. The season of Epiphany lasts until the day before Ash Wednesday, which is calculated from when Easter is set for that particular year. You can read how to find Easter on page 15 and in greater detail beginning on page 818 or just google it like most of us do. Ash Wednesday is the beginning of the season of Lent, the 40 days not counting Sundays leading up to Easter. Lent is this intentional time of reflection and growth that mirrors the 40 days of Noah and the flood, the 40 years of the Israelites wandering in the wilderness, and the 40 days Jesus spent in the wilderness after his baptism. 40 in Hebrew numerology simply means a very long time. The sixth Sunday in Lent is not called the sixth Sunday in Lent, but Passion or Palm Sunday, and is the day we celebrate the arrival of Jesus into Jerusalem before his arrest and crucifixion. Many congregations have palm fronds and crosses folded out of strips of palms and parade through their neighborhood or around the outside of the church building before entering for worship on this day. Palm Sunday is the beginning of Holy Week, the last week of Lent. Maundy Thursday is of this week is the day we remember Jesus' last meal with his disciples when he washed their feet. And some congregations set up a way to wash one another's feet as part of their worship on this day. At the end of the Maundy Thursday worship service, all items are stripped from the altar, and the altar is covered in a black cloth as we remember the betrayal and arrest of Jesus. Good Friday and Holy Saturday follow as we reflect on the pain and anguish of Jesus at his death and the despair of the disciples as they witnessed it. These days are good and holy because we are reminded that God comes to us in love, where we are, as we are, to be with us at all times and in all places, 
so that we are free to live as God's beloved children. Without the events that we celebrate through Holy Week, we wouldn't have Easter, the celebration of Jesus' resurrection from death. And the services outlined in the BCP from Monday, Thursday through Good Friday and Holy Saturday are really one continuous worship service that culminates in the great vigil of Easter, which is to take place sometime between sunset on Holy Saturday and sunrise on Easter morning. And to me, the most meaningful words of the entire BCP are the rubrics at the beginning of the great vigil that say, in the darkness, fire is kindled, followed by this invitation. Dear friends in Christ, on this most holy night in which our Lord Jesus passed over from death to life, the church invites her members dispersed throughout the world to gather in vigil and prayer. For this is the Passover of the Lord, in which by hearing his word and celebrating his sacraments, we share in his victory over death. If you notice in the BCP, there is no special service for Easter Sunday. Each service in every Sunday of the year celebrates the resurrection of Jesus. So that all that we are and all that we do, we live in God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. The season of Easter is 50 days and brings us to the Feast of Pentecost when we celebrate the birth of the church through the coming of the Holy Spirit upon the disciples. Following Pentecost, we step into what we call ordinary time. The six months between Pentecost and the new Advent when we will begin all this yearly cycle thing over again. Our faith is lived out in this ordinary time in the regular routines of our regular and ordinary days as we love God and our neighbors with all that we are and all that we have following Jesus in the way of love. In the Episcopal Church, we recognize two sacraments, those specific acts that Jesus commanded us to do, to baptize and to remember him in the bread and the wine. These are the only services that use holy in our prayer book. Holy baptism is the full initiation by water and the Holy Spirit into Christ's body, the church. We often use shells or something made to look like a shell to scoop the water in baptism. This cookie would actually make a terrible scoop, but it's a fun way to celebrate someone's baptism. The Holy Eucharist is the principal weekly worship service in the Episcopal Church. We come together to remember all that God has done for us in Jesus Christ. Through the holy mystery of the bread and the wine as body and blood, we are made one with Christ and Christ with us. This cookie depicts the wafer and the wine used in communion. And although it isn't proper elements for communion, it's a fun and yummy way to illustrate it. We'll walk through the Eucharist service step by step in another video. For now, I want us to finish going through our Book of Common Prayer. And while not sacraments, we do recognize other sacramental spiritual markers on our journey of faith that we call sacramental rites. We have confirmation, the adult affirmation of our baptismal vows, the celebration and blessing of a marriage in various forms, the reconciliation of a penitent, a private confession between priest and penitent that all may ask for, some should request, but none are required to do. There is unction, which is the anointing with oil and prayer those who are sick or near death, and orders. Holy ordination to deacon, priest, or bishop. Celebrating these life markers within our Christian worship and in community help us to be sacramental people, seeing God always at work around us and through us as we follow Jesus. These life events are in the sections of the BCP titled Pastoral Offices, 
and Episcopal services, and I invite you to read through them. It will deepen your understanding of who we are as the Episcopal branch of the Jesus Movement. All right, we're in the home stretch. Next comes the Psalter. The Psalms are ancient poems and songs of praise to God that express every possible human emotion. They offer us the authenticity and honesty which with, with which we can come confidently before God who knows our humanness even better than we do. One or more psalms are read at most every Episcopal service and in the daily office. If you follow the traditional daily reading schedule as noted in the rubrics, you will read through all 150 psalms every 30 days. After the Psalter is a section of prayers and thanksgivings in which you can find the words for prayers and giving thanks for most every possible situation. And as I've said before, don't let the placement of the outline of faith being toward the back of the book lead you to think it isn't significant. Please make the time to read it through. Whether you've been in the Episcopal Church your whole life or are relatively new, you'll learn something you didn't know before. And instead of going through the historical document section, I'll give you a symbol of our history in the form of the Episcopal shield. The white field with the red cross is the cross of St. George, the patron saint of the Church of England. And this remembers the Episcopal Church's roots in the Church of England. There are nine miniature crosses on the field of blue, symbolizing the nine dioceses that met in Philadelphia in 1789 to ratify the initial constitution of the Protestant Episcopal Church in the United States of America. The crosslets are formed as an X-shaped cross of St. Andrew, the patron saint of Scotland. This remembers the Scottish Episcopal Church's important role in our history as it was their bishops who ordained Samuel Seabury to be the first American bishop in 1784. The colors each have symbolic meaning as well. Red is for the blood of Christ shed for us and also for the lives of the martyrs of our faith. White is the color of purity and blue is the traditional color of the Virgin Mary, the mother of Jesus. And finally, a short explanation of the two lectionaries provided that begin on page 888 of the Book of Common Prayer. The Sunday lectionary goes through the Bible every three years, labeled as years A, B, and C. Each Sunday, there's an Old Testament reading, a psalm, a New Testament reading, and a gospel reading. No matter where you attend around the world, the readings will be the same for those churches in the Anglican Communion that follow the lectionary. The lessons are appropriate for the season, and it's often quite obvious what the connecting theme between the four readings is. The lectionary for the daily office is a two-year cycle labeled year one and year two. Each day has an assigned Old Testament reading, Psalm, Gospel, and New Testament reading. And generally the Old and New Testament readings are done at morning prayer and the Gospel is read at evening prayer and the Psalm is split between the two. So we've covered a lot in a short time and I hope this has helped you discover an appreciation for this amazing book we call the BCP. Next, We'll walk through the daily offices and the Holy Eucharist services, but for now, I'm taking a cookie break. <laughs>